Welcome to Culture Wire. I'm your host, Meg Schiffler. We're back from summer vacation with an exciting new episode about the arts and culture scene in San Francisco. We're here at the Arts Commission Gallery, where the exhibition Conversation 5 is currently on view. On this episode of Culture Wire, we'll meet one of the artists from the spectacular exhibition and travel to the heart of the Western Edition to check out the newly renovated African American Arts and Culture Complex. We'll also take a closer look at how the arts impact the city's economy with a visit to the King Tut exhibition at the Dion. On August 13th, after nearly six months of construction, the African American Arts and Culture Complex celebrated the completion of its $1.5 million renovation. We'll take a look back at the grand opening, which kicked off with a ribbon cutting and showcased the center's many community programs and resident artists, including the venerable Rodessa Jones, co-artistic director of the acclaimed company Cultural Odyssey, who mesmerized the crowd with a powerful spoken word performance. But you ain't been beat down by your own damn mama. You don't know that kind of drama. Hi. I'm Judy Nemsoff and I'm a program director at the San Francisco Arts Commission with the Community Arts and Education Program. I'm here today with London Breed to take a tour of the African American Art and Culture Complex. Hi London. Hi Judy, how are you? I'm good, how are good. you? Tell me a little bit about the building. Well, this building has been through so many different changes and most recently we've completed a 1.5 million dollar renovation and we had this amazing grand opening that was attended by people far and wide throughout the Bay Area. Tell me about what, what takes place here in the building. We have uh, several art galleries in this building. We have dance studio. Um, we have a multi-purpose room that's huge and it's used for so many different things. A recording studio, an amazing theater. I mean, there's so much that happens in this building. It's always used. It's always used for different things at the same time, which is very exciting. So tell me about this gallery. We're on the first floor. There's um, some beautiful things up. Tell me a little bit about what goes on in here. Well, this is a Sergeant Johnson gallery, and we have a number of exhibits. We have at least five exhibits in this gallery annually. And this particular exhibit was a uh, exhibit that we did in order to honor the, the changes in the facility. And it's called Repurpose because this building has been repurposed into so many different things. So the exhibition here now is tied in with the big grand opening that you told yes, us about earlier. Yes, so everything that's in here has been um, made with some sort of recycled materials, things that have been used for different purposes. Let's move on to the new renovated um, entrance to the theater that's on the ground floor and just around the corner. Great. Why don't you tell me a little bit about some of the renovations that have taken place here? Well, we've done um, accessible renovations to this entire building, but in particular with the theater, we've uh, opened up the seating. We've also added some step lighting lights that so that when people are trying to get around in this theater, in the dark, they can see in order to get to their seats. Uh -huh. We've opened it up with some lighting. We have a portable ramp so that person with disabilities can get onto the stage. Tell me a little bit about some of the ways in which the theater is used and some of the performances and events that take place here. Well, we've had film festivals, we've had uh, one-man shows, we've had um, Marcus Shelby Orchestra, their whole orchestra was on this uh, stage here. We've had youth performances, dance, drama, comedy shows. I mean, just anything that you can think of. Well, it's a great first floor introduction to the African American Art and Culture Complex with the gallery and then the beautiful renovations that are um, in the bathrooms and now this uh, beautiful tour of the theater. Let's head upstairs and see the other changes that are in the building. One of the things that's really a surprise is how big this building is and how much space and activity goes on here. The kids just dominate this entire floor. This is their home. This is where they come to learn about visual and performing arts. This is where they come to showcase their artwork. This is where they come to learn about how to be an artist in any shape, form, or fashion. We have a recording studio with a lab, and so we always have a ton of young people who utilize that lab for so many different things. They learn about 
audio engineering. They learn about artist development and how you carry yourself as an artist. Are there painting classes and other kinds of art classes that take place right here on this floor? Yes, well we have uh, artists who come in and who teach the children visual art, of course, and they come up with innovative, creative things to do. But we also collaborate with the broader community. Artwork is brought here from all over the district, from Booker T. Washington Community Center, from Ella Hill Hutch Community Center. Uh, the other thing they do is claymation, so they do some films and they add sound to that, and so we have that playing. So we try to make sure that visual arts is not lost in everything that we do in this community. And we're standing in this incredible dance studio that's very alive with the dancers on the mural on the wall. Are there dance classes that take place here too? Of course there are. <laughs> dance classes are essential. Um, our kids love hip-hop dance, but we realize that there are so many different dance disciplines and so we have taught over the course of the summer uh, modern dance and they did an amazing modern dance performance when we had our opening it was absolutely incredible that's great i also love the drums that are over in the corner of the studio uh, it they're part of the recycle theme from the gallery downstairs yes. they're they're just beautiful and the kids playing them were a great part of the opening yes yes they had a good time they took the old water uh, cooler the empty ones and they just start painting and I'm like I have to pay for those <laughs> they look but, great. you know when I heard them playing and just hanging out and just enjoying themselves and creating this cool little environment just in their world and everyone started to gather around them and dance and have fun that's what art is about right. it's about creativity it's about having fun it's about you know discovering what's inside you and allowing it to come out and everyone to see that's exactly right Let's go upstairs and see what's taking place on the third floor now. Great. This exhibit is called Simply Nina. And what we did was put out a call for artists and we had a response for artists all over the Bay Area. This is 26 artists who created original pieces for this particular exhibit to highlight Nina Simone, to highlight her beauty. And why did you decide to open your grand reopening with the Nina Simone, Simply Nina show? We decided to open uh, with this particular exhibit of Nina Simone in order to pay homage to our ancestors, to say to our young people, we have some amazing artists who live their lives enjoying what it is that they do. And we wanted them to understand what Nina Simone is about and what other artists are about. There's a great moment when you come off of the elevator and there's a beautiful interview, one of Nina Simone's final interviews. Um, and it kind of is a wonderful welcome to all of the renovation that's taken place here on the third floor as well as an introduction to the Simply Nina exhibition. What else is going on on the third floor? It feels very different than the, than the other two floors. We do everything here. We do events, we do programs, we do classes, we do meetings. We have so many different things that this place offers, not only to the community, but to the broader San Francisco. This building has an incredible feel to it, from the gallery downstairs and the theater, through the classroom space, the dance studio, and this beautiful hall of culture. Tell me a little bit about how you've gotten this building here, about the spirit of community, and how you work with the community to really sustain this incredible building. I wanted to make sure that we created the kind of environment that people can thrive in, that people can grow in, that people can become who they are in their culture, in their everyday lives, and to be better at what it is that they do, whether it's the arts or anything else that they choose to do. And it's not just about the community that we serve. We understand that there is such a need for African-American institutions in the Bay Area to thrive. And I want to be an example to all the young people who are coming up now to say, hey, you can do it, anyone can do it, not your circumstances should never dictate your outcome, and you can become successful, and you can give back to your community, and you can make a difference. And all the people that tend to come through these doors are people who care not only about this institution, but they care about making a difference. And so that's what this place is about. If you want to make a difference with anyone in the arts or whatever it is that you choose to do, come here. This is the place that's here with open arms. You've done an incredible job. You should be really pleased and proud. It was a wonderful grand opening. And thank you so much for your time today and showing me around your building. Thank you, Judy, for having me. Thanks, London. Be sure to check out the art exhibitions Simply Nina and Repurpose which are now on view at the African American Culture Complex. 
To learn more about the center and its upcoming exhibitions and performances, visit www.aaacc.org or call 415-922-2049. Also stay tuned for an upcoming episode of the Arts Commission's podcast, Deep Roots, which will take a behind the scenes look at the Cultural Center's capital campaign. You can subscribe to Deep Roots by visiting the press and media section of the Arts Commission's website at www.sfartscommission.org. As a result of the economic downturn, arts programs and organizations all over the country are facing drastic budget cuts. As we're about to see, the arts play an important role in the health of our economy. For example, did you know that for every dollar San Francisco invests in the nonprofit arts and culture sector, seven dollars return to the local and state economies? Director of Cultural Affairs Luis Cancel met with Joe D'Alessandro, the president and CEO of the San Francisco Convention and Visitors Bureau, to discuss how the arts impact tourism and generate revenue for the city. He also sat down with John Buchanan, the director of the De Young, where the blockbuster exhibition Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs is currently on view. Welcome to the second season of Culture Wire. You know, San Francisco is blessed with several world-class museums. And today, we're in Golden Gate Park visiting one of those world-class museums, the De Young Museum. The De Young has several exciting collections, oceanic art, African art, art of the Americas, and as we stand here now, a very important and impressive paintings, American paintings and sculpture. But in the life of a museum, they also organize and mount special exhibitions. And joining me today to talk about one of those special exhibitions is the director, John Buchanan. Hi, John. Hey, Lewis. I'm happy to have you here in amidst the great Rockefeller painting collection of the de Young Museum, and hopefully to talk about our current special exhibition, King Tut. Absolutely. Because actually what we wanted to focus on with you today, John, is we, as we mentioned, we know that the museum has great permanent collections, but you are, have organized one of the a very, very important special exhibition of Tutankhamun. And I wondered what is the impact of this ex special exhibition has been on your attendance. Well, Lewis, first of all, you know this is a really significant uh, milestone for not only the museum but also San Francisco. Uh, the King Tut exhibition was here in 1979 in a smaller version. Uh, I like to say that he's back, uh, he's older, he's bigger, and he's brought his family with him this time. Uh, there are over 120 objects and works of art in our current exhibition that comes to us from the Cairo Museum. Uh, the King Tut exhibition, Lewis, like all of our special exhibitions, uh, finds its strength and derives its origins from our own collections here at the museum. And you know that we're interested not only in American paintings, but also in antiquities, including ancient Egypt. Uh, so it is part of the history of the museum. It's part of our collections. And it's a natural for us to want to share these treasures before they're never seen again uh, with people here in San Francisco and people who come to San Francisco from throughout the United States and the world. You know, one of the things we want to know, John, was how did you bring this exhibition here? Well, just shortly after my arrival in early 2006, the Egyptian government contacted us and said, say, we're going to put King Tut back in America for a few select venues. We know that in 1979, the original exhibition occurred at the de Young Museum. Would you be interested? And so we leapt at the chance to be able to do that because the works of art under themselves are incredible treasures and have resonance with our audience. And as I say, this has a piece of history uh, of the museums itself. And uh, I know that the exhibition is going to be here all the way until March 28th of 2010. 
Uh, but what has been the uh, sort of the impact on in terms of audience for you here? Well, we opened to the public on uh, June the 27th, and we've had several hundred thousand visitors purchase tickets to see the exhibition. We are exceeding our expectations, and at the end of the run of the exhibition, we will release final figures. Suffice it to say, we're very pleased with this, and we think that uh, it particularly, Luis, has uh, played well for the tourist season here in San Francisco. Uh, we certainly know by the the many languages that are being spoken here in our galleries, that people from throughout the world, particularly Europeans who have come to spend their euros, uh, people from Japan and people from China, people from South America, have come to San Francisco and made a visit to King Tut, one of the items on their pilgrimage here in our city. We certainly hope uh, that it has caused them to spend that extra night in a hotel room, uh, go for that extra lunch or dinner uh, at a nearby restaurant, and and hopefully uh, to spend some extra tourist dollars in the retail operations throughout the city. An exhibition like this at the De Young uh, really has very wide repercussions economically throughout the whole city. And, and so here you've illustrated exactly one of the ways that the museum is helping to sort of spread the wealth, so to speak. I also think, Luis, that uh, as we say, a, a rising tide lifts all ships, and uh, I'd like to think that the tourist business here in San Francisco uh, over the past uh, four months, let's say, has helped all organizations, not to mention businesses. We have this wonderful synergy now with our new neighbor, the California Academy of Sciences, and it thrills me to no end when I see the cross current and the backfill between our audiences on a daily basis. Let's talk a little bit about the, the extraordinary works that are in the exhibition. I know I've had the opportunity uh, to visit the exhibition on two occasions now, and I'm really struck by, you know, especially the polychrome, polychrome wooden, you know, sculptures and objects that are that are in the exhibition. They, it, here, it's phenomenal. Yeah, isn't it? this is these are 4,500 year old objects in many instances, and, and, and it's hard for us, you know, in modern times to really wrap our minds around uh, the beauty, the craftsmanship, the delicacy. Not to mention the sensitivity and fragility of these objects that have survived for that long. You know, I, I spoke earlier about 50 objects came to us in 1979. We now have over 100. 20 objects, and I think that five of my favorite new objects include some of those polychrome uh, objects. One is that wonderful wooden polychrome statuette of King Tut himself. Uh, I think it is the greatest object in the exhibition because it allows us to look over that many years into the eyes of a real human being. It's not the sort of uh, iconic image, it's the natural realistic image of a young teen teenage boy fabulous object. We also have uh, the inclusion of two nested small fetal coffins, uh, and in fact they are quite exquisite uh, gold enameled objects that were found in King Tut's tomb. They contain fetal material that are leading the experts and scientists to believe that the contents of these coffins were the children or the offspring of King Tut, uh, and just shortly the DNA results will be available to confirm that and perhaps to even uh, attribute uh, not only the fatherhood but the motherhood. Uh, oh, that's very exciting. Oh, it's really very cool. This is phenomenal. Uh, also, as I mentioned, you know, King Tut brought some of his family members with him, uh, and uh, we have the incredible coffin of. Tuya, uh, an in-law of King Tut's father, Akhenaten, in all its golden splendor and something really not to be missed. And you know, one of the things that I also wanted you to sort of let our, our viewers understand is how a special exhibition like this helps the museum, you know, from, from Egypt. Oh, well, you know, it's I, what I call an international cultural exchange, and uh, every person who comes to the exhibition must have a ticket, uh, and part of that ticket price goes back to the Egyptians to help them in the restoration of their museums, and particularly in the building of a new museum at Giza. So, John, I just want to congratulate you for Thank bringing you. this extraordinary collection to San Francisco, and I want to give you the last word to our viewers. So, what would you say to them? 
come now, because this is an exhibition that you're going to want to see more than once. Uh, it's intriguing, 120 artifacts and works of art, uh, really a walk through ancient Egyptian history uh, through the eyes of one of the most famous individuals who've ever lived. Joining me now is Joe D'Alessandro, the president of the San Francisco Convention and Visitors Bureau. And Joe, why is it that San Francisco is, always seems to rate you know, at the top as a tourist destination? We're iconic. People from all over the world imagine coming to San Francisco. They've seen San Francisco on movies and on television shows and have always had strong, compelling desires to come here. So we're fortunate because of that. For relatively a small city, we're, I, we are a world-class destination. And I think it's also, uh, part of that diversity has also allowed the city to uh, sort of celebrate its cultural diversity. And, and so it has developed a very interesting cultural infrastructure you know, over time. Uh, right now, uh, the, the legacy of the young uh, has, has led to the expansion of a really phenomenal museum, uh, which currently has this Tutankhamun exhibition. And what do you think that museum and that exhibition uh, I I impact is on the economy of San Francisco? What you're finding is you'll find visitors, whether they're coming from, say, somewhere nearby like Sacramento or coming from Los Angeles or coming from Seattle or Portland, the nearby markets, will make a special trip to San Francisco because they hear that the uh, de Young is having the, the uh, Tut exhibit. And when they come here, they have to pay for transportation, they're paying for hotels, they're paying for restaurants, they're spending not only just a few hours in one day to see the exhibit, but they're going to stay several days to get the whole San Francisco experience as part of what they're doing. And that's what really contributes significantly to the economy. What's an interesting statistic uh, nationally is that more people go to arts and cultural institutions and exhibits than go to uh, uh, spectator sports. So you, you have this blockbuster exhibition at the De Young. They're having record attendance there, um, which of course the admission prices help the, the museum. But what you're pointing out is in fact the, uh, the fact that people are staying longer at the hotels means that the hotel's occupancy is, is higher. Absolutely. Uh, and the economy of San Francisco and the government of San Francisco benefits from that because of what's called the hotel tax. Absolutely. You want to explain what the hotel tax is Absolutely. and what it does? Absolutely. The, the visitors are paying our taxes for us. Without those visitors, we'd have to come up with a half a billion dollars more annually in taxes. So when a visitor stays in a hotel, they pay 14.5% uh, uh, hotel tax, which goes to the city general fund to pay for these uh, activities. They pay a restaurant tax in many cases. They pay a sales tax, which helps to go into uh, 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 our economy, go into the government. They pay taxes on car rentals. There's a whole variety of taxes that a visitor to San Francisco pays that a, that a resident doesn't even see sometimes. You know, one of the things that uh, the average citizen doesn't often uh, really uh, understand is how the hotel tax benefits them, you know, uh, directly. Uh, but for instance, the San Francisco Arts Commission and uh, Grants for the Arts, both of our grant funds are all funded and subsidized by the hotel tax. That's exactly right. And the grants for the arts and those funds go to help a lot of the very significant institutions that we appreciate so much as San Franciscans. Some of the major institutions and some of the minor and um, kind of up-and-coming uh, arts groups in San Francisco are helped by uh, grants for the arts and the Arts Commission. Also, some of our street festivals and fairs that we enjoy so much are helped through those, that hotel tax. So that hotel tax really does play a major role in the quality of life that we treasure so much here in San Francisco. Yeah, like for instance, uh, you know, the cultural centers that the Arts Commission funds, you know, there, there are seven different cultural centers. Some of them are physical, have physical buildings and spaces like Soul Marts and Mission Cultural Center and Bayview Opera House. Right. Uh, and like the other part of this, we're celebrating the African American Arts and Cultural Complex's renovation and ribbon cutting that took place a few weeks ago. Um, and, and some of them are virtual. And so, you know, it's really, you know, people don't make the connection sometimes how a major exhibition at the De Young, Teuton Common, you know, will eventually, uh, through its economic impact on the city, also benefit neighborhood cultural institutions. That's exactly right. And, and frankly, without the room tax, the hotel tax going into these cultural institutions, many of them could not exist as they are today. They couldn't uh, um, have some of the programming that they have today, or they certainly couldn't charge the, the, the prices that we uh, enjoy today, because it would have to be more without that hotel tax. So those tourists that come in for a blockbuster and spend their money in the community and see other arts events and, and institutions really do help the arts scene in San Francisco quite a bit. 
Well, Joe, I want to thank you for you know helping our listeners to understand how a great exhibition like Tutankhamen uh, filters its way and impacts the daily lives of citizens that may not even visit the exhibition, uh, but that you know are really concerned with putting you know sort of the, the daily bread on the table. It's absolutely right, Luis. Thank you for letting me share that uh, enthusiasm for what the arts and culture do to the quality of life in San Francisco. Tutankhamun and the Golden Age of the Pharaohs will be on view until March 28, 2010. To find out more and to purchase tickets in advance, visit famsf.org. In addition to being the host of Culture Wire, I'm a contemporary art curator and the director of the San Francisco Arts Commission Gallery. Currently on view in the gallery is the exhibition Conversation 5, which is part of an ongoing series of exhibitions featuring a local artist alongside an artist from another point on the globe. The intent of this series is to give visitors a closer look at the production of two individual artists and to show how artists from our region participate in an international contemporary art dialogue. Making its Bay Area premiere, Nicholas and Sheila Pye's critically acclaimed video, Loudly Death Unties, is a contemporary take on an ancient Irish folktale in which a banshee's scream announces the inevitable death of someone. In Loudly Death Unties, a banshee in the form of a little girl appears to a couple, and through a series of uncanny circumstances, she forces one lover to say goodbye to the other. Local artist Jamie Vasta is renowned for her exuberant glitter paintings depicting dark and dramatic narratives. For Conversation 5, we commissioned Jamie to create a new series of paintings that revolves around the mythical stories of sirens luring sailors to their death. I like the figures in, in, my, in my pieces to be kind of personifications of the glitter. Um, and the glitter is this thing that is, um, that's kind of captivating and beautiful and also feminine. I probably have accumulated close to 200 different colors of glitter. Some of them are more reflective than others. Some of them are really powdery and fine and I can do very crisp details. I paint with the glue and I paint like one little section at a time and say, okay, this, this is gonna be matte black or this is gonna be shiny black or this is gonna be shiny black with a little bit of green in it. Well, I, I think a lot of times when people look at my work, it's really all about all about the material for them, and they they come into the show having this set idea about glitter, and it's either like, ooh, glitter, oh, I like glitter, and and then the narrative gives them something to wrestle with, or they come in and they're like, oh, I don't like glitter. But maybe these are these are these are painted well. Um, I I I do like it when I can win people over who say that they hate glitter. Conversation five closes on September nineteenth, two thousand nine. So be sure to stop by before it's too late. We're located at four hundred one Van Ness at McAllister Street, and the Arts Commission Gallery's hours are Wednesday through Saturday. 12 to 5 p.m. For more information, visit sfartscommission.org forward slash gallery. In addition to Conversation 5, the Arts Commission Gallery is also presenting a photography exhibition called 10 by 10 by 10, which is located on the ground floor of San Francisco City Hall. Curated in partnership with Photo Alliance, 10 by 10 by 10 features work by 10 local photographers selected by 10 local curators. Viewing hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And at 155 Grove Street, we have a new site-specific installation by artist Ajit Chauhan. Both exhibitions end September 19th. Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts presents Encuentamiento, a night of storytelling on Thursday, September 17th at 7 p.m. 
For more information, go to missionculturalcenter.org. Kearney Street Workshop, the nation's oldest Asian Pacific American multidisciplinary arts organization, will present its 11th annual Aperture Festival, featuring emerging Asian Pacific American artists. This two weekend long festival will take place at venues throughout San Francisco with each night dedicated to a different arts discipline. For more information and a schedule of events, visit kearneystreet.org. Don't miss the rescheduled performance of Patrick McCuacane's Hula Company at the Yerba Buena Gardens Festival, September 27th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. More details at ybgf.org. On the next episode of Culture Wire, we'll enjoy the sounds of Futuro Picante and explore the Mission Culture Center for Latino Arts. We'll also take a look at world-renowned artist Maya Lin's latest public memorial at the California Academy of Sciences. You can send us your comments and tell us what you'd like to see on future shows by emailing us at culturewire at sfgov.org. Thanks for watching Culture Wire on SFGTV.